On October 31st, 2021, global leaders and environmental activists converged on Glasgow, Scotland for the 2021 United Nations Climate Change Conference, also known as COP26. The conference, which will end today, is a critical United Nations conference that aims to shape climate negotiations and ensure countries stay consistently aligned and committed to reducing their carbon footprint. Given Nigeria's leading role in tackling climate change and as a signatory to the Paris Agreement, COP26 offers a unique opportunity for the country to work with partners to make progress on securing global net zero carbon dioxide emissions or attaining carbon neutrality by 2050. COP26 will also assist Nigeria to adapt strategies to protect communities and natural habitats, as well as mobilize the much needed finances to meet global climate targets. To this end, the UNDP has chosen Arise News Channel as a partner to host a conversation aimed at strengthening public awareness on COP26 and promoting a shared understanding on the urgent need to take climate action as a critical priority for Nigeria's future. Now joining us from Abuja to throw more light on the importance of COP26 are Ambassador Mary Beth Leonard, US Ambassador to Nigeria, Ambassador Katriona Lang, British High Commissioner to Nigeria, Mr. Mohamed Yahaya, UNDP Nigerian Resident Representative, and Mr. Olumide Idowu, a Nigerian climate activist, and Halima Bawa Buari, Acting Director, Climate Change Ministry of Environment. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to The Morning Show. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Well, very quickly, let's start with you, uh, Ambassador Lang, uh, COP26. Why is it important? And do initiatives like COP26 really work? Very important. So COP26, that's the conference of the parties bringing together 197 countries and bodies to essentially take forward the breakthrough agreement that was negotiated in Paris in 2015. The Paris Accord is a legally binding document which sets us on a course to try and hit a target to ensure that the climate can stabilise, um, to, to ensure that humanity can continue to, to lead a good life. So what we're trying to do in Glasgow is take that legal framework and essentially flesh it out by um, setting out which each country's individual contribution will be to hitting those climate targets and second, setting out the kind of processes and systems that underpin that. So, for example, how people will report on how they've delivered on their commitments, how the funding allocations will work to ensure developing countries can be supported in their transitions. So it's a two-week conference. The first two days, the leaders came together. Um, the second four or five days, we had some big breakthrough commitments on things like coal, and methane and forestry. And since then, what's been happening is that the, uh, the negotiators have been sitting down really trying to flesh out the nitty gritty of the agreement. So yesterday was the first draft of the, that covering document. And I understand overnight they've produced a second draft. And of course, we shouldn't underestimate the complexity of this. This is 197 countries. We have to reach consensus. It's not by a majority vote. And there are a range of different interests from countries that are still, like Nigeria, um, oil and gas exporting countries, to countries that are suffering already from enormous impacts of climate change, also Nigeria. So you could be in both of those camps, both an oil exporter, but also already suffering the impacts. So essentially what we're trying to do is, first of all, set out what the mitigation trajectory will be to keep us at 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels, which will enable us to stabilize the climate. Secondly, to help countries prepare for what is inevitable, to adapt because climate change is already, is already with us. Thirdly, set out the final financing to support that. And then fourthly, uh, agree how we will work together as countries and continue to come back to revisit. So in 2023, there'll be a global stock take to make sure that if we need to raise our ambition, we'll do that. So very important. And we're right in the, in the end game now. And it's a great pleasure to be here this morning to talk about it. Yes. Ambassador Leonard, what are the key priorities that have emerged from COP26? How do these impact Nigeria? I mentioned that in the, the, after the leaders' conference, we went into some uh, what you might call thematic negotiations. Um, 
But the first and foremost, I think what's been really a big breakthrough since Paris is that the science has shown us that we're really on red alert. So even in Paris, we were thinking that potentially two degrees might be adequate. There is absolute consensus now that we need to hit 1.5, and that's being written into, into the agreement. And in order to do that, it's incredibly ambitious. Um, we are going to need to halve global emissions in the atmosphere by 2030. So that's what each country has been asked to do, is set out what's called a nationally determined contribution to show how they will set that out. Nigeria has indeed done that, set out an ambitious plan. But over and above that, um, we need to go further. By, net ze by 2060, we need to get to what's called net zero, which means that we balance what's going into the atmosphere through carbon emissions with what is absorbed through what's called the carbon sink, so essentially forestry and oceans. So we need to be on track by 2030 to halve our emissions, and we need to hit net zero by 2060. So that's the first set of commitments that we've been negotiating at Glasgow. Secondly, money. Money really matters, particularly, obviously, for developing countries who are suffering the, the effects of this more than we are, even more than we are in the West. There's a commitment to deliver $100 billion. We should have done it by 2020. We have to hold our hands up. We didn't do that. But there is a glide path now to hit that by 2025. But we've gone further than that. Um, the big finance companies, $130 trillion now of investment finance, that's 40% of global finance, is coming behind us to support these transitions to low to low carbon, so investment more in renewables, for example, than in coal and gas, to ensure supply chains are sustainable um, with forestry and so on. So that's on the money side. Um, I mentioned these thematic commitments. So there's been a very important commitment on forestry. This is probably one of the big breakthroughs. 130 countries, that's 91% of the world's forests, have committed to eliminate deforestation by 2030. Hugely important for Nigeria, um, who's suffering, th losing 3.5% of its forests each year. So Nigeria's come in behind that commitment. Um, the fourth agreement is on methane. So that's 100 countries who've committed to reduce uh, methane emissions by 30% by 2030. And again, really important for Nigeria, which has been a big methane producer. So methane is the second most damaging uh, carbon emission gas. And then finally on coal, this has been pretty controversial and we're not quite there yet, but 40 countries have committed to phase out support for coal in their own countries and indeed to stop supporting coal investments in, in other countries. So all of that together gives us a really good stock of progress. Um, it helps get us onto the right trajectory. But we're not there yet. We're not yet at 1.5. So we have to see Glasgow as a big breakthrough. It's starting to turn the curve downwards, but we'll have to revisit this. So this, this stock take in 2023 is going to be really important. But it's definitely taken us in the right direction. Leonard, what are your views on the key priorities that have emerged from COP26 and their impact on Nigeria? Thank you. Um, you know, I think uh, very definitely, you know, the advantage of COP26 was to get leaders from around the world to be able to talk about how to get the world significantly more on track uh, toward that 1.5 degree of warning, warming. And um, I very much endorse my, my UK colleagues' uh, sentiments. I'd also like to highlight uh, one point that uh, I think we can uh, not, we really can't uh, overemphasize. Climate change is a problem and a crisis to be addressed, but it can also be seen actually as an opportunity. Um, it's a creator of opportunity because you need to rally the private sector uh, to mobilize needed technologies and investments. So you can sort of look at the climate crisis as a, an enormous economic opportunity, which will allow us to create new jobs and new industries. And how this impacts, impacts Nigeria, well, you know, climate change is already here. You know, every country is feeling the, the fires, the floods, the droughts, and, um, it, you know, it needs to be addressed now. So I think that Nigeria was a really active partner in discussions on how to do so in uh, in, uh, in in Glasgow. Uh, for example, uh, the Minister of State for Petroleum, Silver, um, met with our Energy Secretary uh, Jennifer Granholm, and was one of the uh, Nigeria became one of the several founding country partners for Net Zero World. And the idea of this is generally U.S. support for helping countries to design their own specific technical and investment plans to help implement their implement their climate pledges. 
And of course, uh, President Buhari confirmed Nigeria's presentation in the Global Methane Pledge, which we're really pleased about. Um, our Minister of Environment, Akia Zor, spoke at our Clean Energy Demand Initiative. This is sort of the, um, the economic opportunity side um, of the crisis, where big US companies like Amazon and Nike and Hewlett Packard pledged to buy the renewable energy products and technology um, that suppliers uh, that might uh, uh, produce to, for use uh, in their own operations, also in, uh, in places like Nigeria. So it's sort of a question of creating advanced demand for products and technologies that can give companies comfort um, about going out and, and engaging in that entrepreneurship. So climate change is here. It impacts Nigeria, too. And Nigeria has been a really enthusiastic partner in Glasgow on so many of these initiatives. Well, thank you, Ambassador Leonard. But uh, let me come straight to you, Olumide. Uh, uh, I mean, you are the uh, climate change activist. Are there concerns that you have? Are there questions you, you would like to ask uh, the other panelists? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. I hope you can hear me clearly. Uh, thank you. Um, Nigeria and the climate change and how it's really impacting communities, one of the uh, great conversations that has also been going on and how it actually is affecting our daily life. So I will try to throw my questions to uh, Mahmoud. Is climate change real, and how do we know for sure that it's impacting Nigeria? Uh, th thank you for the question. Uh, climate change is real, uh, and it's been experienced every day. Uh, I have traveled around this country. I've seen the impact of climate change, and you can start, for example, on the issue of Lake Chad, with 90% of the, of, of the lake shrinking. Uh, there's a direct link to climate change. Uh, you can see the uh, unparalleled heat wave that the country has seen. For example, in 2020, uh, Nigeria, uh, Nigerian cities of the, up to 20 to 22 cities experienced uh, temperatures at least 40 uh, degrees Celsius or above. Uh, unparalleled, again, never happened. So you, you see forestation, uh, the impact uh, of, of deforestation around the country, uh, partly related to climate change, but also uh, the impact that has on on. on on, uh, on, the on our ability to manage uh, the, the climate. So, absolutely uh, real. It's been experienced impacting livelihood across the country, but also uh, contributing to conflict and instability. You see it with the issue of harder and farmer conflict that is a direct uh, related to the issue of climate. You see it on insurgency in, in the Northeast related to people who have been recruited who have lost their livelihood. So this is a very, very serious issue. This is why the world has come together in Glasgow. This is why the alarms have been raised around climate emergency, because it's not only about our own ability to, uh, to live with nature, but also how it's impacting people's ability to, to eke uh, living across the country. So for Nigeria, like everywhere else, is a significant problem. And I'm glad to see that the President Buhari's commitment, and also glad to see that this country is very serious through his NDCs, uh, and, and it's, uh, its commitment to uh, net zero. Thank, thank you very much. You've raised two key very points about the elders men and the NDC. So uh, can you give us an example of how Nigerians are being impacted by the climate change in their everyday lives? Absolutely. I mean, for example, if you look at uh, uh, the rain, inconsistent rain patterns, this country, 70% of the farmers rely on what is called uh, uh, rain-fed agriculture. So they essentially wait for consistent rains to be able to, to do their harvest or to, to plant and, and etc. Uh, this has been interrupted, so they really don't know uh, how to go about it. You see this also related to cost of food. We talk about cost of food every day. Why is food more expensive, partly because pro production has reduced. Why has production reduced? Partly because of uh, people, uh, the uh, climate uh, variability that farmers are not able uh, to, to, to farm or the rains are coming in, in the wrong, wrong time. So th this is, has impacted across society. Uh, if you look at the issue of conflict, I've mentioned, and I've been on the, the lake itself, both on the Chad side, and I've been on the lake, uh, 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 around the lake in the Nigeria and in the, in the Cameroon side you see people's livelihood devastated with the disappearance of the lake. And this has been going on over a longer uh, period. Or you visit Lagos, you see how coastal communities have been impacted. Erosion uh, has become 
uh, devastating for communities. So you can go around the country and you see how this is impacting, especially those vulnerable already. Uh, this is the problem. You, it's not only impacting the climate change globally to everybody, but it's really in poor countries or developing countries like Nigeria, it's impacting those most vulnerable, those who call uh, or see the environment as their asset. Right, thank you. I'm aware, Ambassador Lena, that you have your questions that you'd like to ask your fellow panelists. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, well, so we've just heard uh, Mo outline, you know, the, the, the way in which uh, this uh, impacts uh, um, uh, Nigeria. So then the question is, what is Nigeria doing to adapt and respond to the crisis? So I wondered if I might ask Halima in her role as acting director of climate change, what is the federal government doing to address climate change here in Nigeria? Ah, then, then, then we're going to go to Olomide. What are local organizations and actors doing to address climate change? Thank you very much. Uh, I, I will quickly mention that uh, the, uh, the support of the, uh, the small grant program have actually been a very great opportunity for uh, the impact on our uh, young generation and how activists have been impacting their communities. We have a lot of people uh, doing a lot of tree planting coming from the northern part of the country. And you see that coming from the, uh, the southern part, we see the sea level rise and uh, the flooding. And a lot of young people are coming together to make sure that they communicate climate change so that people can be able to understand the impact and how they can actually translate that implementation. So it's very, very important that uh, uh, what we are doing, and we want to see us or see more other young people to understand the impact of climate change, how they can relate this to their local community, because we cannot take culture out of them. So we need to start engaging them more and put more important opportunities for young people. Thank you. And if I can ask my fellow panelists here, Catriona, what more do you think can be done to address the issue of climate change? So, well, here in Nigeria, um, as we mentioned, say, the, the government of Nigeria did put forth an ambitious, nationally determined contribution, which is its plan to um, reduce global emissions by 2030. And uh, we was very welcome to see that they also made a commitment to net zero by 2060. So for Nigeria, 60% of its emissions are coming from energy and 25% from land use. So that's essentially the, the heart of the plan. So I think first and foremost, and they, I think if the Nigerian government representative were here, what she would say, because we've heard it from the president, from the VP, environment minister, is a challenge back to us to, um, to recognize that N Nigeria also has another big challenge, which is access to energy. It's got 40% of its population without access to reliable energy and also very reliant on um, bad forms of energy. So if you're out in the rural areas, you're a woman, you're cooking using charcoal and firewood, and this is very polluting, uh, very damaging to, to people's health. So we need to help Nigeria, um, I think post-COP, really help them set and train um, a strategy that will deliver on both of these issues, a low carbon transition energy strategy, but one that also delivers access to the people of of Nigeria. And that inevitably means they will need to, re to use gas for some time, but gas is less polluting. Liquid natural gas, compressed natural gas is less polluting than some of the, the fuels that are being used at the moment. So I think uh, helping with that transition, um, perhaps doing a deal in the way South Africa did in, in, in Glasgow um, to bring a number of the big partners, US, EU, UK, behind their transition, which is actually even more challenging because they're totally reliant on, on coal, actually. But I think a plan to really help Nigeria to, to manage this to transition in a way that helps with energy access is challenge number one. Part of that will be, will be solar. Solar does have a role. And um, one of the problems, frankly, in Nigeria is that it's very expensive to put solar panels on because of very high VAT and very high customs. And I know Nigeria is worried about losing the revenue on that, but we've done a study which shows that actually you will get more revenue by reducing customs and VAT because if people can put solar panels on their homes and on their businesses, they will be more productive and in they, that will enable you, the government, to, to secure more revenue. So we'd really encourage you to, to tackle that issue. And there are many companies, British American companies, who are here to help on solar. So that's on the energy side. I think Nigeria's got ambitious plans on the transport side to move 
move um, to to roll out mass transport systems, um, bus systems, and to move those buses onto liquid national natural gas as well. Um, the really tricky areas are going to be industry, sort of sectors like cement, um, very energy intensive, obviously a big big sector here. And uh, we will need to support Nigeria, manage, manage those transitions. And then finally, and Mo mentioned this, um, land use and deforestation is absolutely crucial. It's a huge part of Nigeria's emissions. As I mentioned, Nigeria is losing 3.5% of its forests a year. That's, that's really worrying. And one of the reasons for that is um, people are cutting down these, this, um, these forests to obviously to try and uh, secure land for agriculture, but also cutting down forests for cooking. So again, Again, we need to tackle both of those issues, lose, lose, use less land for agriculture, but make it more productive so you don't need to use so much land and to integrate forests into your, into your land use. One thing I did want to flag um, at COP that was really important was that President Mo, um, Bahari was invited to the Great Green Wall meeting that was hosted by President Macron. Um, and uh, he, the Nigeria takes over the presidency of the Great Green Wall next year. This is a this is a hugely ambitious project across the whole Sahel to reforest essentially. And we know that President Pari is a big enthusiast for this project. And that was a, another of the big breakthroughs at at COP26. So those are some of the areas that Nigeria will need to tackle. And we, as the key partners here, US, uh, UN, UK, and others, are of course here to support and help. Ali Mabwari, I see you've joined us. Uh, thank you for joining the conversation. But I would like to ask you, do you have any questions uh, for either Ambassador Leonard or Ambassador Lang or Mr. Mohamed Yaya? Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this show to enable us to talk about Nigeria climate change uh, initiatives and actions and, of course, uh, partnerships. So to our very good partners, uh, the USA, the UK, and, of course, UN uh, entities. Um, what's important for us, of course, is the support, and most of the support we have gotten so far has been within the UN uh, UNDP space, and this has enabled us to do a lot. Um, however, since I've been asked to ask a question, uh, how do we see the UNDP uh, further supporting or any other entity and countries further supporting on the NDC implementation plans, because we have a beautiful NDC, it's been acclaimed. Uh, but then uh, we need to have this translated and we need to have that same and even more technical support and the financial support we've had in developing that uh, document towards uh, developing an implementation strategy. And to the UK, uh, we're looking towards support for the adaptation end of things. And I was very happy to hear uh, Her Excellency talk about the land use issues we need to pursue and uh, the forestry issues too we need to pursue. Uh, we are very confident that when, uh, uh, with the work we put in uh, developing the National Action Plan Adaptation Plans, uh, we will be in a very good uh, setting to roll out a lot of actions in the adaptation space. So the question here is, um, we would like to know what the, we've had commitments during this COP uh, by Canada specifically on how much they are ready to put down. Uh, what do we uh, have, in, what does the government of the UK have in stock to help us towards that adaptation uh, pathway we hope to balance towards our net zero? And to the USA, uh, how do we work together towards actualizing the energy compact that we did uh, sign even at uh, the Onga 74. Thank you very much, uh, Alima. But uh, at this point, we'd like to take a short break. When we return, uh, we'll have your responses to the opposers raised by Alima Buari. We'll be right back. It's still the Arise News Channel. Welcome back to The Morning Show here on the Arise News Channel and thank you for joining our conversation, the UNDP Arise TV live uh, program on Nigeria and climate change. And thank you, uh, uh, Your Excellencies, Alima and Mr. Yaya for staying with us also. Before we went on break, Alima, you addressed a number of questions. Who do you want uh, to respond first? Perhaps the UNDP representative? 
Yes, the UNDP can start. It's a global entity. <laughs> Yes, uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you. Uh, good to see you. Just you're absolutely right. Maybe for the viewers, uh, uh, we, you know, we, we who work in the UN sometimes we use a lot of acronyms. Uh, maybe uh, I should start with what the NDC means. <laughs> so each country uh, is tasked uh, under the Paris Agreement to report on its uh, emission uh, um, plans. So Nigeria submitted it in May. Uh, saying this is how Nigeria uh, uh, plans to reduce uh, its em emissions as, as part of the Paris Agreement. So we at the UNDP have been working with the Ministry of Environment to be able to prepare that, and the ministry and, and the government did very well in meeting the deadline to do that. But those are just commitments. So the next stage is to actually uh, start implementing them, costing them. How much will it cost for Nigeria to go green? What is a transitional plan for Nigeria? We already know that Nigeria is calling for just transition, which essentially means that <coughs> jumping uh, uh, from where Nigeria is straight to green may be difficult for the country. There, so the, uh, you've probably seen the vice president's uh, op-ed uh, in the international media where he called for what he calls a just transition and using gas as that kind of transition for the country, <coughs> considering uh, the amount of uh, Nigerians with no power. Uh, then the other area that we are really interested in working in is on the adaptation. This country has to adapt. The climate is already above where it sh should be. It's already impacting people. So we need to really look at adaptation plan. Uh, the, I know the government has an initial plan. It needs to be costed. Essentially, this means what does it take for farmers who are now experiencing uh, 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 inconsistent rains and are experiencing much more severe droughts to still have the kind of seeds that are drought resistance. How do people who live in coastal towns survive and flourish in what is already a, a rising sea levels? So this is what the adaptation really means. The country needs to adapt to this kind of uh, unrecognized un, un uh, uh, climate uh, patterns. <coughs> so we will be supporting uh, that work uh, with the government. Uh, then the, other, the entire area of carbon trading is another thing. Uh, um, uh, the world now is discussing uh, uh, the issue of carbon trading. This essentially means what will the world uh, pay, essentially, for Nigeria not to cut its forests? How do we do development in a way that, that, uh, that, that, that uh, protects our environment but also contributes to, to, to reduction of emission? So we are at UNDP involved in all this discussion. We've been tasked by the international community to support governments to be able to transition. Just to finish one word, the issue of climate change here is not only about survival, which is extremely important, but it's also about the future. The country that goes green is the country that will lead in, in, the, in, 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 in the fourth industrial revolution. So for Nigeria, going green is, is one of being a corporate citizen, protecting our future, protecting the future of Nigerians, protecting the livelihood of Nigerians, but also it's about positioning Nigeria as a cutting edge fourth industrial revolution country that relies on green energy for its development. And I think that is where we want to be able to engage government and support them. All right, that's a great point there. Um, Halima Bawabwari, are you satisfied with that response or do you want to throw the question to their excellencies, ambassadors Leonard and Lang? I did uh, throw uh, Her Excellency, their Excellency's uh, questions already. Uh, each for uh, had a question. Each the UK had a question on adaptation and uh, support for that, and then the UK, uh, the US uh, Excellency also had that on energy. So should I should I take the adaptation mm -hmm. question? Um, so Modes, I think, set out very clearly what the overall framework is for this, um, for the challenge, the set of challenges Nigeria has. And just actually picking up Mo's last point, the importance of the opportunity, and Mary Beth also mentioned this. So we've estimated that there's about 100 billion plus um, investment opportunities in green climate um, related infrastructure whether it's energy or different forms of agriculture and so on. So they, as Nigeria, with a country with the amazing young talent that it has, and just to give one example of that, you know, one of the, the uh, shortlisted candidates for the Earthshot Prize, this is the prize that Prince William set out to inspire people to come up with um, climate-related innovations. He was one of the shortlisted candidates with a very smart idea around a mobile 
um, solar powered device essentially to, to charge your phones and so on. Um, great young guy, great example. So, you know, there are many, many young technological ent entrepreneurs out there who are looking to find solutions to these problems, both the mitigation, energy transition side, but also to find ways to help Nigeria adapt. So that's, that's the positive side. In terms of where the UK is, as I mentioned earlier, one priority I would like us to see come in behind is on the support for helping Nigeria manage this just transition. So I think Nigeria is, is a very important voice in the international community, not just in Nigeria, for us to recognize that you know, we've all got energy access, we take it for granted in our countries that the lights stay on. When you've still got 40% of your population not with energy access, that transition has to manage both. So I want to help amplify Nigeria's voice on that and also help us come in behind it. In terms of specific areas we're, we're providing support in, just to run through briefly, so we funded um, advisors in both the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Environment to tap into all this funding that's out there. So this commitment finally of $100 billion uh, a year to hit by 2025, Nigeria should get a much larger share of that than it's getting at the moment. It's not tapping in to the funds that are out there, the various climate funds. So that's an area where we're helping by providing technical support to scan the opportunities and ensure Nigeria gets its fair share. We've done a lot of work on agriculture, sustainable agriculture. So in the north, for example, we've helped 600,000 people move to more climate resilient forms of, of agriculture, but also help people to save so they're prepared for shocks, because unfortunately, climatic shocks are going to hit us more frequently. That's just inevitable. So the key is for people to be resilient and to be prepared, and savings is one means of that. So that's another area. In Edo State, we're working on sustainable supply chains for palm oil to ensure that um, the forests aren't destroyed as the country moves into, into palm oil, for example. And we're going to be scaling up those kind of investments going, going forward. I mean, the UK has ring-fenced a substantial amount of funding for, agri for climate, 12.6 billion up to 2025. So that's also a share of that I want for, for Nigeria. And I think finally, um, we want to come in behind the, the amazing young advocates as we're hearing, hearing this morning. So helping give them a platform and a voice to hold their government to account, to hold our government to account, and to ensure that, that you, the voice of the youth is heard loud and clear. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. And, and in my turn, um, thank you, Helene. Thank you, Ambassador. Ambassador. And, 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 Yes, thank you. And in my turn, thank you, Halima, for that question, which I think goes to the very fundamental issue and a big part of the debate in Glasgow. How do individual members of the international community, what obligations do they have to help individual countries in their, in their adaptation and their action against climate change? So the, you, you may, may have seen that our Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, was, um, at the Afri had an Africa Adaptation Acceleration Summit on November 2nd, and he said very explicitly, the world, especially those countries that contributed a great deal to the crisis in the first place, must stand up and help. The United States is committed to working in partnership with countries in the region. And I've seen President Buhari's uh, statements about the need for sustained technical and financial support uh, being needed for di uh, developing countries to meet their uh, climate goals. So I think um, the, pro the U.S. approach to the conference meshed very well uh, with, uh, with that view. I would point in particular to uh, a U.S.-China joint declaration um, uh, yesterday. Here we, this is a big deal. Here we have the two world's largest emitters um, who got together and uh, uh, recorded a, a full three pages of things, of, of a roadmap uh, for the, the, the types of actions that these two countries need to follow uh, to, to do their part. And it also had the, uh, the, over the course of a decade, actually, but it also very explicitly re referred to both of those countries' recognition of the significance of adaptation and the specific need to scale up financial and capacity building uh, for these processes in developing countries. So what does that mean here in Nigeria? Well, for example, at, at COP26, uh, the U.S. announced the Build Back Better World Infrastructure Initiative, uh, which we hope and anticipate is going to mobilize hundreds of billions, with a B, uh, dollars in infrastructure investment in low- and middle-income countries. President Buhari joined uh, President Biden and uh, Secretary of State Blinken, European Commission President von der Leyen, and U.K. Prime Minister 
Minister Johnson, to address and announce through uh, the international commitment to address the climate crisis through infrastructure development. And I think President Buhari's remarks really framed nicely the challenges that uh, Nigeria has previously faced in the area of infrastructure development and some of the principles they'd like to see from future infrastructure initiatives. On agricultural best practices, uh, we were very proud to participate in the National Adaptation Planning Global Network to help countries in Africa develop practical whole of government adaptation plans. And our work will continue with partners in Nigeria and across the region on issues like uh, promoting clean energy, preventing deforestation, and, and improving climate awareness. Uh, back to the United States, uh, President Biden has the emergency plan for adaptation and resilience called PREPARE, which will bring together all the agencies of the U.S. government to provide financial and technical support for vulnerable uh, communities and countries. And finally, you know, President Biden has pledged to work with co uh, Congress to dedicate $3 billion annually in adaptation finance by 2024. And, and this is the largest commitment the U.S. has ever made to reduce the impact of climate change on those most endangered by it around the world. So I think that you know, the U.S. And t t completely anticipates working closely with the African Union and other African partners, including Nigeria, to shape and implement uh, climate smart policies uh, across the continent. Well, um, Ambassador Lena, let's just stay on that point a little bit. You've talked about what can be done by the U.S. specifically uh, in terms of technical support, in terms of infrastructural development, but the international community generally, beyond the American uh, side of it. What specifically do you think that the whole international community can do in terms of rules and responsibilities? An international community in this regard will include perhaps also the private sector. Yeah. So, you know, I think that, you know, um, uh, and, and Ambassador, uh, High Commissioner Lang uh, outlined um, some of the specific areas that had been discussed in, in Glasgow. And I think uh, you, you can sort of walk through um, the different energy sources and see how people are, are um, thinking about uh, managing them in a healthy way, right? So we come into this, uh, this conference with a commitment to do better towards that 1.5 uh, degree warming and, and then start drilling down on particular things that you can do. Uh, for example, uh, uh, raising your aspirations about what you're going to commit to so that we meet, that, uh, meet those goals. And then how do you do that? Coal. Um, you know, there was a, um, there a lot of discussion about, you know, getting away from coal because of its, um, its high emissions potential. And there was really a, a, a very interesting event there where the U.S., U.K., France, and Germany, and the EU ha have agreed to work specifically with South Africa to, um, on their transition away from coal, because right now they use coal for over 75% of their electricity generation. But the idea is that the way this initiative plays out will become a model for other developing nations to, to, um, uh, uh, to use cleaner energy than coal, which releases uh, so much carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide. Um, there's a lot of uh, conversation around the use of gas. Um, and, uh, and of course, we know that I've heard loud and clear that Nigeria uh, uh, wished to use this as a transitional fuel. There was a, a, a statement signed by 30 some countries, including the United States, on the issue of financing uh, for, for, for gas projects. And I think that there is still a, uh, an element of, of debate there. I have this mental image of people in Glasgow running around madly in the last day of the conference as, we, yeah. as, they, as they iron them things out. But it says the, the, the way the statement read was uh, uh, ending direct public support for the international unabated fossil fuel energy by the end of 2022, except in uh, clearly defined exceptions with uh, limited and clearly defined circumstances uh, for, which leads one to believe that there is a discussion going on about, you know, what is an abated fossil fuel uh, investment look like and, and how does that conversation continue? Clearly, there needs to become a happy day on our planet where we have moved away from fossil fuels. Equally clearly, um, you know, issues of justice and, and transition, where does the off-ramp happen uh, for those as you reach that, that ultimate goal. So I think that's a conversation that continues. Um, I, we all have to remember that this, this conference is about a lot of benchmarks and commitments. The real work is when we all get together and, and implement those um, and see how they work out and move them forward. This question is for three of our panelists, Mohammed, Yaya, and Ambassadors Leonard and Lang. I'll give you a breather, Ambassador Leonard. So I'll start with Mohammed Yaya. What does the UNDP, the American Embassy, and the British High Commission prioritize in climate change efforts in Nigeria? One is obviously implementation of uh, Nigeria's commitment in the NDCs. Uh, uh, so 
now after Glasgow, uh, I think the action has to start, the implementation has to start, and I think the international community been behind the leadership of, of the Nigerian government to be able to implement those uh, commitments. The other part, which is for, for our side, uh, is also to look at in, in more detail what, how do we uh, ensure the adaptation issue is dealt with immediately. Because this, uh, for communities whose livelihood has been devastated by uh, climate change, uh, there's no time. They're already impacting. For them, climate change is not a theory. It's, a, it's an experience that is, is really reducing their ability and, and impacting their resilience. In already societies, people who are already experiencing extreme poverty are now uh, uh, burdened with an, in, uh, the inability to eat life because of, of the situation of climate. So we need to help those communities. UNDP is already working with a lot of communities uh, around uh, uh, seeds bank, uh, 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 taking indigenous seeds and making sure that they, we, we have them in storage. And those, in many places, we find indigenous seeds are actually much more uh, better equipped to deal with uh, uh, climate change. But also helping communities to adapt. As I, I mentioned, coastal communities around southern Nigeria, uh, those communities have been, again, impacted uh, uh, with the expected sea rise. Sea rise. We, you, you are now uh, talking to us from Lagos. Lagos is in serious risk around any kind of exacerbated uh, climate change with, uh, with, with the floodings and, and etc. So we are working, for example, with the Lagos uh, government uh, putting through uh, financing from the Global uh, uh, Climate Fund to be able to create resilience and adaptation for communities who live on the coastal town. So the issue here really is to support Nigeria to reduce its emissions. The emission of Nigeria is relatively small compared to what uh, richer countries do, but still Nigeria is the largest emitter in Africa. So Nigeria has to do more in reducing emission to help Nigeria transition to clean uh, uh, energy uh, sources but also helping communities that have been devastated. I think all those things need to be done at the same place. The issue of deforestation. Uh, many viewers may not know, but Nigeria has lost more than 55% of its forest. There are about 8% of forest cover left in Nigeria. How do we protect that? So there's a lot of work to be done. And from a UNDP side, working with the international community and under the leadership of the government, we are committed to be with Nigeria all along. Now, um, this question, for you, Ambassador Lang, what are the priorities for the British High Commission in climate change efforts in Nigeria? So, um, just to kind of kind of emphasise some of the points I've I've already made, I think you know we've got to start from this, the perspective of the poorest people. That's that's really could put ourselves, if we can, in their shoes and their eyes, and that, and build from there. I I fear, and that for me takes us to the real priority is around land use and deforestation. I think that is the single most important thing for Nigeria to tackle um, because it's also contributing to climate emissions and reducing Nigeria's ability to, to absorb as a sink, but primarily because it's impacting the livelihoods of the poor. And that has to be our priority. So I think that means a, a really radically different approach to agriculture, which I know is very much on the, the plans for, for the Nigerian government. But it really means that we have to get the each um, hectare of land has to become more productive so we don't need to use so much land, so we don't need to cut down so many forests. So I would like to come in strongly behind the, the UNDP work that's going on. We've got a, a huge programme we're designing at the moment in exactly the same area. Um, and it will also focus on trying to ensure that uh, people have access to markets, because of course, ultimately, people need to be able to sell their, their products. So it's, it's coming at it from the point of view of different kind of sustainable agriculture, which doesn't, enable, doesn't require you to chop down trees and so on, making the land more productive and also livestock more productive, hugely important. Remember the National Livestock Development Plan? It still remains really, really important. And, and also ensuring that um, people are resilient so there's a savings element to this to make sure people can manage their, their, their incomes through shocks and, and so on and so forth. And as I said, making sure that um, things like sustainable palm oil has, actually has a market so that people can meet the standards to, to sell. So you know you can't look at this from, from one individual angle. You have to join up the environmental bit, the agricultural bit, the forestry piece. But I think primarily we need to look at it from the point of view of the individual poor people who are, who are really struggling at the moment. So that, for me, would be the top priority. Thank you, Ambassador Leonard. The top priorities for the American Embassy on climate change here in Nigeria. So, 
I mean, I think in particular, obviously, we're looking forward to working closely with Nigeria's government and its people on, on this vital effort, and, and in particular to following through with Nigeria on some of the initiatives that they either endorsed or were co-founding members on um, in Glasgow. I mentioned already the, uh, the net zero world on technology and investment strategies, uh, the global methane pledge that, that Nigeria has joined, and all the agriculture and, and land use initiatives for all the reasons that, um, that uh, Katrina just mentioned, including the fight against deforestation, as, as Mo said. And we have heard loud and clear uh, that Nigeria prizes discussions on how to partner on technical and financial support uh, to meet uh, it, it Nigeria's climate goals. I think also, as in many aspects of our relationship, the private sector is going to be key in all of this. Um, there are already so many US companies involved in implementing renewable, clean, and environmentally safe energy sources like solar mini grids to power everything from health clinics to homes to local manufacturing that also supports job creation. Um, so the private sector is going to be big on, on individual solutions within countries, as they are also going to be big in uh, coming up with the bright new ideas um, that the world needs uh, to, to come to climate change uh, and creating all kinds of opportunities and investment and new technologies. Um, you listen to the UN resident representative and their excellencies. Uh, the three of them, uh, among other things, talked about deforestation. Now, a few uh, years ago, uh, President Buhari uh, made a pledge to plant 20 million uh, trees. Where are we now with uh, uh, that initiative? Alima, if you are still with us. Alima. Alima? Yes, I'm still here. Okay, yes, I said uh, the excellencies and the UN resident rep talked about deforestation, among other things. And the Nigerian government declared uh, an initiative to plant about 20 million trees just a few years ago under the present administration. Where are we now with that initiative? What has well, become of um, it? Okay, uh, quickly, I would like to say that a lot of efforts have been made in that direction and that has further been uh, increased with the, if you check the economic sustainability plan that came out right after the COVID, the issues there about um, trying to pursue the issues of afforestation, uh, the government on its own, as you, you recall, had issued uh, two sovereign green bonds, and uh, one end of it was to help in increasing the forest uh, restoration effort of the government and individuals, as the case may be. So we, we are working on, on that. And uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, also gone into some other projects, including uh, that coming from the, the state governments, which has been encouraging. There have been some state governments that have put in some of the initiatives, the ones in the northwest and in the, in the northeast. Um, so I think we're on track. On, on that of uh, the efforts towards uh, the afforestation of uh, the whole country, as we've had from the UNDP uh, country rep, uh, that uh, we are seriously uh, deforested. But the government is making uh, efforts on every ground, including uh, efforts with the youth uh, within the NYC uh, sphere towards trying to see how we can also improve our youth in the afforestation efforts of the government and indeed even individuals. Well, thank you, Halima. Now, as we begin to wrap up this conversation and in order to underscore the seriousness of this issue, I have this question for Ambassadors Lang and Leonard. I think I'll start this time with Ambassador Lang. Why is it critical to prioritize climate efforts in Nigeria and what will happen if we don't? Well, the, the reason it's critical is because Nigeria is one of the most vulnerable countries to climate change. And with the expected doubling of the population, it's only going to get more challenging. 
So we don't have much time to, to help Nigeria prepare. And if we don't, what are we going to see? Well, what, more of what we're seeing now, basically. Um, more regular floods, um, more regular de desertification, um, extreme climate uh, events. And um, these are all events that will impact, as I mentioned in my previous answer, directly on the poor and the livelihoods of the poor because their assets they depend on are going to be impacted. So we, we can imagine a world that is, is like the world today, but probably five, ten times worse. And we can't, we can't go down that route because it will be absolutely devastating. It will mean there will be probably lots of migration, um, at least around the country, if not in the region, potentially even outside, outside the country. So it is really serious. And I think Lagos in particular is very worrying because it's the powerhouse of the economy. This amazing dynamic mega city, um, and I know the governor is really concerned about this. Um, it's one of the reasons we've got a, a new program coming in, which is for, for smart cities to help prepare for climate resilience. And Lagos is one of our target uh, cities that we're going to be working for, really scaling up the, the flood defences. And you know, frankly, a lot, some people are going to have to move because where they're living now is just not sustainable. Um, so the, the picture is very, very bleak, um, to be honest, um, because I think even if we get to 1.5, which is going to be enormously challenging, I think what we have to recognise, there is already a stock of carbon in the, in the atmosphere and uh, it's already play, playing out. We're at, we're at 1.2 now. And, you know, what sounds like a, you know, relatively uh, small increase to 1.5 is potentially already very significant. I mean, two, as one of the delegates put it at, um, I think the, the uh, delegate from Mauritius or one of those um, low-lying states said, you know, this is a matter of life or death for us. We can't hit, we cannot hit two. So um, that's the challenge, but there is also, as we mentioned, the, the huge opportunity because there will need to be enormous amounts of investment made. And there's a lot of cash out there looking for good returns and opportunities if we can help Nigeria secure it. And one of the reasons I'm optimistic for Nigeria is that entrepreneurial talent. There's no shortage of ideas. There's no shortage of people who are looking to solve these problems. They need to be linked up with finance. They need bankable projects that can be right. scaled up. Um, yeah, so the future is bleak, but there is a way yeah, forward. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that silver lining somewhere in there. Ambassador Leonard, why is it critical to prioritise climate change efforts in Nigeria? And what happens if we don't? Well, refreshingly, our answers, I think, are very similar. It is critical to prioritise climate change because, on the one hand, Nigeria is very threatened by it already and will be in the future. Uh, we need to avoid a future of worsening effects on, uh, like, like desertification, loss of farmland, uh, creating a, a fueling conflict, and the positive, because climate change actually creates all these enormous opportunities, as my UK college just mentioned. And, and what happens if we don't? You know, if you choose to ignore climate change, you are choosing more flash floods. You are choosing longer droughts. You're choosing less land for livestock. You're choosing instability, poverty, and poor health for our families. Nobody wants to choose that. So therefore, we have to choose to act against, uh, against climate change. Um, as the US Special Envoy for Climate, John Kerry, said, we have to get this done. Um, but there is hope. And COP26, as we all come forward out of it and implement these, could be the turning point to get on the right course for what is really a very decisive decade. Well, we seem to have run out of time, and it's on that note that we would like to thank you, Ambassador Lang, Ambassador Leonard, uh, UN Resident Representative Mr. Mohamed Yaya, and Alima Bawabwari. Thank you very much uh, for this conversation.